Thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, I would like to start thanking you all for showing up in this talk. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, you have the question on the screen, what happens when the main maintainer of a project takes a step down? Um, it's a sad moment, probably, but it's also a situation that you're going to experience at any point, probably during your software development career, either because you are the ones taking the step down or because you get affected by a project you depend on and there's some, uh, one of the maintainers is no longer going to be able to provide support. So I don't want to make this talk sad. Right, uh, and in fact, I just noticed I'm just wearing all black. It looks like I'm at a funeral or something, right? I, I don't want to make it like that. So instead, I will um, answer this question uh, and not considering all the different scenarios, but giving you tips to make sure that even if this moment, if you, even if you experience this moment at some point, uh, the project is going to survive. Because the first answer that comes to the mind is like uh, the project dies, probably, right? But let's think about more for a moment. Suppose that you have won a very big project, right? Oh, yeah, the project will survive because, you know, it's very big. Everyone's using it. Everyone's using it. Well, what if that big project, it's so big that only one person can understand it, right? Maybe if that person takes a step down, it won't survive because it's so big that people cannot engage. And then you will say, okay, um, well, it might be also for small projects, they will end up dying. But small projects, because they are small, more people can understand them and more people are contributing to it. So I guess at some point they can survive, right? So it, it's not very easy. It's kind of diffuse to say if a project is going to live or die. But there is a common point always, which is community. Like if you have a strong community behind your project, it's likely that your project, no matter its size and no matter the amount of maintainers, is going to be able to survive in the long term. So for these, and because I'm one of the core developers of Polyastro and we recently experienced this issue or this scenario, I want to use the case of Polyastro to show how our community reacted to this situation and also how you can build an awesome community around your own project. Because there are very nice tips that you can use to engage uh, with a lot of people. So just briefly, some of you already may know what is Polyastro. For those of who don't know, Polyastro is a pure Python library for AstroDynamics. It has uh, some basic functionality for Chewbody, but it focuses also on the ease of use and it has amazing visualization capabilities. It's MIT and it even handles like physical quantities. Here's the link to the repository. And just to quick you a uh, quick overview on the project, you can easily install it from different platforms like Peep, Conda, or even directly from GitHub if you're planning to contribute to the project. And the basic architecture of Polyastro is a core shell where all the basic routines are living in this core directory. Uh, we don't use object-oriented programming in that core. No units, nothing. It's just pure Python accelerated through Numba. So you are the one in charge of dealing with all units. Uh, you want to make sure that whatever values are, you're passing are units compatible between each other. And on top of these kind of dangerous algorithms, we provide a nice high level API in which we're using AstroPy units. Um, we are providing all these visualization capabilities. Um, so that's been like, uh, I think uh, one of the key points of Polyastro because you can get a book, look at the algorithm implemented. And then if you want to start dealing with object oriented programming, design patterns and all that, you just go to the high level API. So let me show you some uh, very quick some of its capabilities. So we provide something called an orbit. This is the basic object, one of the fundamentals objects in Polyastro. So an orbit is just a state representation. You have position and velocity, but you can construct an orbit from multiple uh, constructors, from vectors, from classical orbit elements, from coordinates. SVDB means a small body database. And I was checking this morning, like I cannot remember, there are tons of them, circular, helio, synchronous. 
like a lot of them, but you can see it's very easy just, uh, to just uh, import AstroPy units, uh, Earth from PolyAstro, Orbit, and you can quickly build precision velocity vectors and build your orbit. And for plotting it, it's as easy as using the dot plot method. And you will get this uh, nicely view of a plotly um, um, image. We can also work with maneuvers. Uh, so this is ex extremely useful for um, mission analysis and recreating some of the space missions that have been uh, performed so far. We provide Hoffman, Bialiktiv, and Lambert's transfer. This is basically for navigating through space. You want to go from A to B in a certain amount of time. You need to solve Lambert's problem. And it's as simple as you have your orbit, your initial orbit. You create one of these maneuvers. And then you just do orbit.apply maneuver. You pass the maneuver. And the result is another orbit object. So you, as you can see, you can keep applying maneuvers. So your op orbit gets a getting modified and that's the way we do for performing for example a transfer from earth to jupiter recreating like popular missions uh, and just also this is beautiful pork chop figures pork chop figures are contour maps that tell you when it's the best point to go from uh, point a to point b like which is the most optimum point and i'm very very interested in this problem you can see that here there are some uh, markers indicating the latest missions to Mars. And as you can see, they're in the most optimum point of transfer. Uh, we can discuss later if you want about, I'm really interested in this problem. But uh, you can see it's very, very simple. Like it's, if you are in astrodynamics or orbital mechanics, like it's extremely useful just to write four lines of code and get these high accurate figures. If you want to know more how to use PolyAstro, you can go to the gallery of examples, uh, some background notebooks that we have, documentation, it's really great. We have uh, this quick start guide uh, that I just made to you. And if you even want to go farther, you have videos, talks, and a lot of more examples. So the question is now how uses, or who uses PolyAstro? So, a lot of students are using PolyAstro, most of them, because it's as simple as doing pip install, and you will get this powerful software. Some researchers, and there are some also uh, optimization competitions for transfers, we're using that at PolyAstro, so that's our main source of feedback to the software. However, a quick search on GitHub will show you that uh, some companies like IBM, I was shocked, but they were using PolyAstro in this project called Space Tech SSA, um, Satellogic is a company manufacturing satellites and providing Earth, um, um, Earth observation. Um, so they are also using it in Orbit Predictor and at ANSYS, <laughs> surprisingly, they are using it for a couple of examples because PolyAstro provides these uh, common astrodynamics routines and for quick conversion, it's really great. And also Libre Space Foundation in one of its projects called Polaris, which is machine learning for satellite systems, or might be saying it wrong, but feel free to check all these, uh, they are also great. So let's take a quick look about who started PolyAstro. Probably some of you know this man, like Juan Luis Cano Rodriguez, also known as Juan Lu, he's very popular. He is acting like as the middle gear of uh, between a lot of people that wants to join Python, that are already experienced, he's organizing PyData Madrid, it's an excellent developer, amazing friend. And he's the one that actually brought me into this world of polyastron software development, and there's, um, that's where my career in software development started. And here's a picture of all our maintainers. Um, you can see that uh, here a lot of profiles, so just for you to have an idea, not all of these people are engineers, not even um, aerospace or related with Astro stuff. In fact, some of those are Python core developers or documentation specialists, but it's awesome, like the community we build. They might not be dealing with these astrodynamics, but if they can help us improving documentation or keeping up to date with the latest improvements, that's great and all of them are welcome. So how did we end up building this community? And this is where the key point of this uh, um, talk is, uh, starts. So we operate with this orbit model. 
So gravity basically goes from observers to advocate. There are certain people that goes to your project and thinks, oh, this is very interesting. It kind of fits my needs, but maybe the project is so new or I'm not sure, I'm not so comfortable with that. You also have participants like active users that use, but they have done, they don't have the capabilities to contribute maybe, or they lack some um, background. Then you have developers. And finally, some of these developers are actively contributing and could be understood as advocates. So an observer eventually can become an advocate because gravity is pushing to the center. And this is the model we've been using so far. So you have uh, some talks and tutorials just in case uh, you want to know more about how do we engage with people? Because essentially, if you started a new project, if you have a small project, but you think it's covering a use case and it's very useful, the only way for people to better discover you is to make what I'm doing right now, like doing a talk, attending these sort of conferences, talking to a lot of people, and spreading out the word of your software. And once you build this kind of community or you start uh, building, um, some or engaging with some people, then you should start organizing yourselves through a, through some sort of chat, real time uh, communication. So far, we've been using Element because the projects out there were using that, but you might use Discord or um, Slack, for example. Whatever is required for uh, having a better communication rather than just seeing you from months to months in conferences. This is also a really good way to operate. And once you have engaged with all these chats, what you can actually do is to set up some sort of weekly meetings or monthly uh, meetings, because in that way, you're gonna be able to better organize, like once you have engaged and have like a couple of developers and, or users, you can better collect this feedback. It's way much better than reading a very long thread of discussion on, hey, how can we implement this? And for you run into some sort of issue and you are back one week later and then you see yourself spending your two hours just discussing and reading. That's That might not be the best. So you, even if you can record these weekly meetings and take notes, notes over that, that's, that has been proved to be very, very useful. And something that we face at some point, and I think that's very interesting, is what we call the contrib directory. At some point, what we saw is that mostly engineers with passion in our space were wanting to contribute and introduce new features, but they didn't, they lacked some technical knowledge, or sorry, some software development knowledge and good architecture. So, uh, and on, on the other hand, we were lacking some technical knowledge because they were PhD and it was very specific. So we didn't want to discard their contribution, but we were not uh, so much comfortable adding that to Polyastro because it might uh, lead to a, it, it would make maybe the API a bit not so Pythonic and because we are not so experienced to, to that. So we created this contrib directory so we could place like temporarily their code on the control system. If anyone wants to go there and check it, they are more than, um, it's, it's completely free, but it's not shipped with the source code. But the main key is that we were not rejecting any features or having like a long list of pull requests that nobody's checking. And I think that was also the key because that contrib directory is full of really good pieces of code that we still need to educate ourselves to introduce into the project. And these students were getting like even more interested. Hey, is there any possibility that I can keep investing more time on this? And the answer is yes, there are fantastic programs out there for students uh, that allow to put in contact developers and these students and they will give them some sort of stipend or economical funding. And it thanks a lot to Open Astronomy and Libre Space Foundations organizations for acting as an umbrella of all these tiny projects so we could join, for instance, Google Summer of Code, which has been a great project for us. If you have any project, this is an excellent place, not only to have like a small contribution, but if somebody spends like three months working with you, it would be 
I think a good starting point for them to become maintainers instead of users, or even they could become advocates. And finally, this was also a great point for us, which was like joining Noom Focus. So Noom Focus, you know, is organizing this year SciPy conference, and it's a great supporter all all scientific open source community. And they have something called small development grants. This might be also of your interest. You need to be a sponsor or affiliated project. So if you have a, one of these projects, you really want to join them, and you will be it will be possible for you to participate in these small development grants, which is kind of the same, but we were targeting like a more specific and um, advanced topics when working with Noom Focus. And finally, because you know all this money, it's taking place within the organization, we also wanted to be transparent at finance, because if you usually go to one of these YouTube channels or pause, you will see the usual label, uh, buy me a coffee, right? And you know, like it's just for a small amount of money and you never know if that's actually going to a coffee, right? So we wanted to be transparent at finance and we joined Open Collective. So all the money that goes into Polyastro, you can check whether it's coming from, where is it going? You can have like the receipts for uh, what we are expending money, but basically it goes through the C name, it goes through the CICD pipelines, like paying all those, um, uh, all these platforms that we need for building software. So after all this time, I wanted to have this talk at here at SciPy because uh, we are taking a step down. Juan Lu did it some months ago. I was also contributing, but unfortunately, because of professional reasons, I'm also going to drop down from Polyastro. So that means that the project now has no maintainer at all. Uh, it's going to be used by a lot of students. It's going to be there. The only thing that it's going to affect the project, because not adding features, it's OK. But we need to catch up with NumPy releases that affect AstroPy and PolyAstro depends on AstroPy too, so we get hit by some of those. So it would be great if, even if you don't have the background in our space or engineering, or even if you are not just motivated with AstroDynamics, at least making sure that PolyAstro is still installable by doing pip install and keep providing those features to students who really need those, that would be great. So even if this is that moment, uh, you may want to take a step forward and become the next maintainer of Polyastro or the next one building a project on top Polyastro. And I want to make one last thing uh, before we're closing, uh, be because we're reaching the end. We recently got awarded a uh, $5,000 uh, grant from New Focus. Unfortunately, I'm not will be able to take the money because it's official now that I'm not uh, longer contributing to Polyastro. I was talking with Noon Focus the other day, so it would be really, really nice that if any is interested, if anyone is watching the conference online or in uh, other point, uh, make sure you get in contact with Polyastro and you can get that money. You will need to be complying with what we proposed, which was just implementing some PyVista visualizations and uh, star background stars visualization. And that money can be there for you. And who knows, you can even be the, exactly the, the next maintainer of Polyastro. So I hope all these um, tips have been useful for you when building a community. And I really hope to see Polyastro keep shining and being used in the scientific community. Thank you all for attending this talk. I really appreciate it. Uh, all right. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, thanks for the talk. And if you have any questions, the mic's here. If you are watching online, if you have any questions, you can use Slack, the the track uh, the track specific channel. All right. Thanks. Nice talk. Um, did you folks think about like I mean, do projects like this need some kind of succession plan. Um, I mean, 
must have probably thought at some point as you were building this up and it became more popular that, you know, in the back of your mind, at some point uh, there may be a transition in terms of uh, the lead maintainers. So thanks for the question. Or Juan Lu uh, took a step down some months ago and it was not on my mind to take a step down on the project. I was seeing myself in the very, very long term. Uh, but now this happened like unexpectedly and that may be a very good point. What you may, we didn't have like a long term plan because it was not in my mind, uh, it was not on our minds that something like this could happen. And I see it very, very interesting having a roadmap for projects in terms of what happens. I know GitHub has uh, something called like, um, I don't know, for, for example, if your GitHub account gets terminated, all your projects will go to another person, right? Uh, we should have had a plan for that, but unfortunately we right now don't have any other maintainers or people with enough technical knowledge to drive the project. But yeah, it's a point that should have been added to this presentation probably, like that roadmap of um, lead for leading the project. Yeah, thanks for the talk and um, good luck with the future of the project. Um, I had a slightly different question. I appreciated your suggestion for this contrib space in the project. Um, what sort of process did y'all have for revisiting contributions there and trying to turn them into something that was part of the rest of the project? Yeah, thanks for the question. So basically, um, engineers were the most, um, were contributing there. And we were only asking for a script. They are very familiar just by building a simple Python script with an entry point, a main entry point. So as long as it was running successfully and it was uh, having the right code style, um, we were happy to have those contributions there. Like it could be about any other topic. Of course it was using polyastro. Like if, if you're not using polyastro, why adding it there? But we were not very restrictive in uh, when placing stuff there. It turned out to be very, very, very interesting, and I wish this would have been implemented in other places. Gracias, uh, Jorge. Great talk. Um, my question is, is on the um, on the overall vision of of the project. Um, do you guys have, you know, some sort of guidance for whoever's next? I know you mentioned, you know, visualizations and things of that sort, but Anything on the you know the bigger picture of what you want Polyastro to to be? Um, I wish uh, it to include like three body problem because right now it's only focused on the two body problem and it's good for students. It's good for bringing people into the astrodynamics world, but maybe companies or research labs are more interested in nowadays in three body problem with all these moon missions. So. I would love to have that implemented. Better animations, probably it's something, because we have great visualization, but we don't have animation. It's interactive, you can rotate, but the plot is static. And especially in astrodynamics, everything's moving, <laughs> everything moves, so it's better to have like animations in the long term. Uh, those would be like the main features that should be added in the long term, I think. Um, hi, can you hear me on the, okay. Um, so I had used a project before that had had a maintainer step down and then another group completely separate came by and picked it up. And one of the issues for using that project, even though it had been picked up again, was the PyPy repo was no longer under the control. So it was version locked at an old version, um, even though they were releasing newer ones. And that, that can make it very difficult for some developers in some environments to use your product. Do you all have a plan for how to keep those permissions sort of in the air and out of the water? As, because it's like what happened to you could happen again and again and again until you hit a stable point. So we were in conversations about that because um, you, you mean accessing the PyPI token or yeah. write the credentials for uploading new versions. Um, so we were discussing and right now we, we're not feeling comfortable with giving those to 
anyone for the moment. So even like if somebody wants just to fork polyastro and but I understand that the name polyastro is already living in PyPI, right? So maybe it should be named like another project. Uh, maybe at some point we are back at polyastro. I think that's gonna be very difficult in the coming years. Um, it's not something like, a, I, I think we just took the quick decision, so to say, like for the moment we are not sharing that token and the project will be like on standby, probably. Sure. Sure, probably. The only issue is that um, we need, you, you need to build this community, right? You, you need to become from, a, uh, from an observer to an advocate and also engage with the maintainers to build this trust relation to have access to that. But for sure, we are more than welcome. You ju we just wanna make sure that the people are like on board with the project. All right, do we have any other questions? Hello. <laughs> um, I have a question. So you listed some organizations and some of them are pretty big, right? Like IBM. Do you think any of them are interested to help keep this alive? Well, that's a good question. I know uh, Juan Lu at some point got in touch with some big companies. <laughs> uh, Juan Lu wrote a post about it. And maybe we didn't push hard enough to get like financial support or some sort of support. And s most of the funding has been has uh, been uh, devoted by uh, new focus and open source community, uh, not by big organizations. I guess because they might reject Python, they might be using other all um, compiled languages instead. But we never got a good reply. Maybe we should have tried uh, harder. Juan was saying that in his post. Right. Do we have any other question for the speaker? If not, uh, let's thank uh, again uh, the speaker for the for the great talk, and it's going to be, I think, a ten-minute break. Thank you. Well.